Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And I uh, have to apologize for being double booked and that I haven't been able to attend many, many alcove, uh, alcove talks. Um, but I want to uh, say something now in this half hour about, uh, uh, well, a paper that is called Real Phase Structures on Matroid Fans and Matroid Orientations. And uh, this, uh, I guess the idea behind uh, the, that one particular work and then a couple of others, so a paper soon to appear with Jiho Yuan, is to try to use ideas of toric and tropical geometry to uh, study oriented matroids as well. So uh, those two fields, toric and tropical geometry, have been extremely fruitful in the study of matroids, the work of Jun He and many other people. And uh, this, uh, this work is kind of an attempt to give the structure or the language to bring orientations, which are extra structures on matroids into that uh, setting as well. So what is an oriented matroid? Here's a, just a catchphrase. So uh, as matroids are an abstraction of independence in mathematics, ma oriented matroids um, uh, abstract independence in the setting of so directed graphs or uh, linear algebra over uh, totally ordered fields or uh, hyperplane arrangements. Um, so we think of our field as being the real numbers, where we uh, have you know a notion of plus, minus, zero, and also totally ordering things. So uh, here we just have a picture of an oriented graph. So orientation on a graph, I just mean directions on the edges. And uh, real hyperplane arrangement, um, we have not only the vanishing locus of a bunch of uh, linear functions or the hyperplanes, so where the linear functions are zero, but we can also ask ourselves for the, we fix some defining linear form for this hyperplane. We also have a notion over R of the side that is positive and the side that's uh, negative. So the oriented matroid is gonna abstract these, uh, also the sign behavior. Okay, so um, as with usual matroids, you can give an oriented matroid, oops. You can uh, describe an oriented matroid in various ways with um, various settings of axioms. So the language that I wanna use is one of, of co-vectors. So this will be a, uh, uh, for an oriented matroid on some ground set E, which will be just the finite set. So think the collection of your hyperplanes or the edges of a graph. Um, it's going to be a collection, called C, of, uh, well, E tuples <laughs> that have values in zero, plus, uh, or minus. These are called the co-vectors. And they'll have to satisfy three axioms, which I won't bother to write down, because um, I'm going to give another equivalent description in a second that's much more uh, geometric or topological. Okay, so um, I'll get back to these topes in a second once we do uh, an example. So the theorem that I want to use, and then to give an example, is the following one of Folkman Lawrence, uh, which says that uh, every oriented matroid, so every one of these collections of so-called co-vectors that satisfy the, the three axioms that I didn't tell you, um, uh, they can always be represented by an arrangement of pseudo hyperplanes. So uh, what I mean by represented, I'm going to describe in this example, uh, where I don't have a, a collection of pseudo hyperplanes here I have honest hyperplanes so pseudo hyperplane is some kind of relaxation topological relaxation I don't need these things to be linear but they need to intersect as if hyper they were um, hyperplanes intersecting each other okay so how do we get the co-vectors from such an arrangement well we can for each does this work to zoom in yeah okay good so first for each kind of region of this subdivision of R2 here Right? I have some edges, I have a vertex, and I have some cells. I can assign um, a vector of zero plus or minuses, where, so the ith coordinate of that vector, I look at the ith hyperplane, say, so if I'm doing this region, I do uh, the, look at the hyperplane zero in its linear form, and over here, I'm on the plus side of that linear form. So this one becomes plus in the first, in the zeroth uh, entry, then the first entry here, I'm also on the plus side of hyperplane one. And I'm still on the plus side of hyperplane two. 
Now, if I cross over to the other side here, then the sign of the form defining the zeroth hyperplane has switched, right? Because I have crossed the hyperplane, so I get this tuple of pluses and minuses. And whereas if I was on this, this edge, then I have zero plus plus. So notice that the, of course, the zero separates a plus and a, and a minus. And we can continue decorating. I probably won't do them all. Um, here at this vertex point, we have zero, 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 because all of the hyperplanes uh, pass through that point. So all the linear forms are, are zero. And uh, let's see, just do a couple more and so on. Okay, so um, all of these for every cell, so I'd have to do all the edges, all of the, the top dimensional faces and so on. We can arrange these into the collection of co-vectors. So these are all the plus zero plus minus E tuples from the cells of the subdivision. of the arrangement. Oops, I can zoom out now, otherwise it's gonna be way too small. And we can also order these by the coordinate wise, coordinate wise with the following, well, partially order these, I guess, with the following order relation. So thinking of plus as being bigger than zero and minus as being also bigger than zero, but uh, plus and minus are incomparable. Okay. And it turns out that this is um, actually, in fact, a lattice when we use this partial order. Okay. And um, so now the, the topes are going to be the maximal covectors with this partial order. So in a non-degenerate scenario, these are exactly the vectors that have no zeros. So they're the, the ones that have pluses and minuses, and these correspond to the top dimensional cells. cells of this subdivision. So topes as in polytopes, because if we have a hyperplane arrangement, or at least poly here, they're unbounded, right? But if we look at it projectively, these would be um, like polytopes. Okay, so I won't describe the axioms because we have this equivalent definition. If I write down any uh, hyperplane arrangement, we'll get a covector lattice, and if we, or pseudo hyperplane arrangement, and if we have any covector lattice, we could just using the theorem, at least translate it to a pseudo hyperplane arrangement. Okay, so every oriented matroid, in fact, has, a, has an underlying matroid, and that's quite easy to get from these, these um, covectors. So we can take um, the set of all covectors and look at this forgetful map where, okay, so in an or, or ordinary matroid, we don't have a notion of kind of signs, and what we can get is uh, the flats of the oriented matroid of the matroid from the oriented matroid by just taking any covector here x, looking at its support. So those are the pluses and minuses, and taking the complement. So we really want to take the zeros that are in the covector of x, and that will be a flat of uh, of the underlying matroid. Okay, so we can go from oriented matroids to matroids, but uh, okay, for those who are maybe familiar with oriented matroids, you know that not every matroid um, admits such an oriented uh, orientation. So you, this map does not have uh, inverses for, for some, or it's not surjective, I guess is the way of saying it. Um, the kind of easiest example is the, the Fano plane. So it's, it's quite, Simple, even just using an Euler characteristic argument to show that the Fano plane cannot be oriented. There's no pseudo hyperplane arrangement for the Fano plane. Um, yeah, so in 1991, uh, Ziegler also constructed infinite families of non orientable matroids of rank three. So there's lots out there. And these are kind of uh, infinite families of non oriented ones that are also sort of minimal in a sense. It's not like you can get one from another one in this very simple, simple way. 
Um, Richter Gerbert also has shown that the testing for the orientability of a matroid, even in rank three, is uh, MP complete. So this is a very different, difficult problem, you can assume, uh, that uh, to show whether, to find out whether or not your uh, matroid is orientable. Okay, so what we want to do with this extra structure of orientations when we have it is uh, to put a different kind of geometry into it. So to give it some kind of tropical geometry. And the way we, there's a lag, sorry, in the sliding of my slides. I think it's moving very slowly. And the way that we'll do that is to look at uh, uh, a matroid fan. Okay, so we already had one kind of topological <laughs> incarnation of an oriented matroid via the pseudo hyperplane arrangement. This one is going to be kind of a polyhedral, at least the underlying geometry, and we're going to then decorate this polyhedral thing with some oriented data. So this is the uh, matroid fan construction of our Dylan Clivens from almost 20 years ago now. And it's this kind of construction of a fan from a matroid that has uh, led to a huge industry of using algebraic geometry to study and toric geometry to uh, study matroids really successfully. So here's how we get the fan uh, of a matroid. So remember, we have these flats. So if you've never seen matroids before and you don't know what flats is, remember, we could get flats from our covector lattice. Okay, these are the subspaces that get cut out by a, a hyperplane arrangement. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a cone so a polyhedral cone for each chain of flats. The, the flats can be ordered by uh, inclusion. So here's a projective arrangement and the flats are all the sp subspaces cut out. So the entire plane, the projective plane in this case, P2, each of the hyperplanes, and then each of these points where they intersect. And then there's also kind of the empty set where, you know, if you try to intersect everybody, they, they don't intersect uh, in a common plane. Okay, so we, we take chains of these, these flats and uh, build a polyhedral cone. So these vectors that will span the cone are basically the indicator vectors uh, for the flats. I'm going to take minus the indicator vector. Okay. And um, the trick then is, so we have these, these cones, we can think of them in the vector space spanned by our set uh, E. But we want to take it, uh, uh, this, the, this fan in the image of the quotient by the all ones vector. Okay. And when you, upon doing that, what we get is, uh, is uh, well, in one hand, a tropical fan. So this satisfies some kind of balancing condition that's common in tropical geometry. Um, and from a point of view of torque geometry, this thing is a Minkowski weight uh, for the permutahedral torque variety. Uh, if you haven't heard that before, then just think that this thing gives you a cohomology class in uh, a toric variety. So something from algebraic geometry. Uh, in this example, here's the, the lattice of flats. So we have the uh, all of these nodes here will give us a ray of the fan. We see all these rays in red here. And uh, any chain, so let's say this chain, uh, will be giving us a cone it's when that's a bad one to choose. Let's take uh, this chain. So V0, uh, 0, and 0, 3. This will be corresponding to this two dimensional cone here. Okay, so this fan is really like, a, well, it's a, a polyhedral fan, but it's combinatorially cone over the order complex of this lattice that we have here and it's put into a vector space in a nice way. All right, so this was a recipe of our Dilla and Clivens from 2006, and now we want to decorate that. So now when we have a matroid orientation, we're gonna assign to each top dimensional face of this fan, let's keep this fan hanging around. So say this fan here, we wanna assign to every top dimensional face which would correspond to a maximal chain of flats. So here are maximal chains. Uh, well, we can take like this, but we really only care about the proper part of that chain, not the zero set or the, the, the full, full ground set E. 
And we want to take the topes, so these maximal covectors that are adjacent to every single piece of that chain. If we think of that chain as being a collection of subspaces in this arrangement. Okay, so let's look at a bit of a simpler example. So here I have a honest or a subspace uh, arrangement and an R2 with again, the three hyperplanes that we started with. And I can take this flag, okay? Um, so that's gonna be the hyperplane one and this point where they all pass through. And uh, the topes that are adjacent to that flag are all of the top dimensional cells that touch both the point that contain both the point and that intersect at least some part of uh, the hyperplane one. Okay, so we have these four, these four uh, regions, and we write down their plus minus vectors. And we can think of these plus minus vectors, so plus and minus uh, it's two things. We, we can think of this as uh, being just a relabeling of the field of two elements or of Z mod two. Okay, so um, we can think of just plus minus as being a field and this uh, Z mod two to the E as being just plus minus to the E. So where plus is then zero and minus acts like one. Right. And so this thing is a this thing is a, a vector space, and we can think of it to ourselves. Well, what is the structure of this set then, if uh, if we think of that as a vector space? And well, we can see that this is actually so we have four points, <laughs> and it's actually a vector subspace of this of an affine vector subspace of this of dimension two. So why is it an affine vector subspace? Well, how did we get these topes? these vectors, you can start with any one. So that's one point in it. And to get the rest, we reflect, right? We can just think we reflect in this hyperplane or then we reflect in this, this point here. And this reflection, if we think in terms of vector space is really the effect of adding mod two, the indicator vector of this flat that we reflected in, right? So this plus one, zero, zero, or plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, gets me over to here. Okay. Any questions? Do people buy that this is an affine subspace? Okay, so because we're decorating the, the, the fan that lived in the quotient space, I also want a quotient by this all ones vector. So let me just notice that those, if we quotient by the all ones with this identification of plus minus and zero one, that these these, uh, these are the same equivalence classes. Okay, so now with that uh, ex assignment in this example and that observation, here's a definition. So if we have a rational polyhedral fan of dimension D, a real phase structure is gonna be a map so an assignment for each of the, these are the D-dimensional faces. Um, we want to map each D-dimensional face and assign it to an affine subspace of Z mod two to the N, where N is the dimension, is the, the space where the fan lives. Okay. And we think of this Z mod two as being plus and minuses but as a vector space. And we can't just do anything we want, we want to satisfy two things. So the first thing is the observation that we just saw, that we want for every every facet, we want that, um, or sorry, we didn't notice this yet. <laughs> for every facet, we want that this assignment, this uh, affine subspace is actually parallel to the Z mod two span of the face that we started with. Um, and then the second uh, condition is that is a kind of, real balancing conditions. So if you know any tropical geometry, there's this balancing condition that's on co-dimension one faces. 
And you should think that this is an analogy of that, but for these uh, strange assignments. So instead of Minkowski weights, where we put integer weights, we're putting affine spaces as weights. And the balancing says that for every co-dimension one face of the fan, if we look at this, so here's the co-dimension one face of this fan. We'll do an example in a second. And we look at all of these top dimensional faces that surround it. And we take the multi-set of the affine spaces that we've assigned, right? So an affine space is also a collection of two to the D points of pluses and minuses. Um, we want this multi-set to be an even covering. So we want everybody in Z mod to, uh, to the end to appear an even number of times. That could be zero or two or four or whatever. Okay, so here's a, an example. I'm just gonna, so this is an R2, so I need to put a pair, pair of a pair of signs on each face. Um, and the condition is that pair, so if I put plus plus here, that, that's giving me one point in my affine space and I need the direction to be horizontal. So this has to be minus plus. And I can put, so that's like taking uh, these two points in Z mod two squared. If I put also put plus plus here, then I have to, to satisfy the parallel condition, put plus minus. And now if I wanna actually satisfy this even covering condition, I'm stuck and I have to, so uh, let's put this here. Okay. I have two choices of affine spaces mod two parallel to, to this. I can take this one or I can take this one. So this and this are parallel mod two. And which one should I take to satisfy the even covering condition? So if I take these two, is it, is it an even covering? No, good, I see some heads. So I need to take this one. So then we put here plus minus plus plus. Okay. So this is a real phase structure on this fan. And I might want to just copy this. Let's see. So our main theorem is that uh, from the paper with uh, Arthur Renaudino and Johannes Rao is that a real phase structure on matroid fans are cryptomorphic to matroid orientations. So um, if you can manage to do this assignment of affine spaces to each top dimensional face and it satisfies condition one and two, then your matroid is orientable. So the proof, um, I'll just say really quickly, it's a easy check. So easy to check that the assignment that I described before using topes uh, is a real phase structure. So we just have to check that it satisfies axiom one and two. And then for the other direction, we use, um, we use uh, induction. So a double induction on kind of dimension and co-dimension of the, the fan, um, deletion contraction. So that's how to go from one matroid to kind of smaller matroids by removing, say, hyperplanes or restricting the hyperplanes, and um, and uh, the last uh, thing we use is that um, ma oriented matroid quotients quotients exist in co rank one, which doesn't actually hold for all co ranks. So that's kind of lucky. Um, I just want to say one thing about what this lets us do. So do I have five minutes or should we stop early for questions? Uh, I think we have another minute or two if you want to just give a quick overview of this slide and then we'll Yeah. So what's one thing that this can be used for um, when you have a real phase structure? So this was our original motivation. Um, we can patchwork the real part. So this patchworking is in the sense of Oleg Viro. It's a very powerful tool for constructing real algebraic varieties hypersurfaces, I should say, uh, with prescribed topology. And well, what we can do to build something kind of real, <laughs> to build something topological, we can uh, take our fan and kind of 
unfolded in two to the n copies of Rn using the information in the real phase structure. So we take two to the n copies of Rn. Here's four copies of Rn here. Okay, and I want to take a face in a copy corresponding to a point in Z mod two if the real phase structure on that face has that sign. So here we would take this diagonal edge only in plus plus and minus minus. And we would take this one in minus minus. So we get some topological space that lives in the something homeomorphic to a real torus and we can close this up in toric varieties. Okay, and uh, this gives us a topological chain in any real toric variety whose fan kind of dominates the fan that we started with. So we get a homology class. That's what our real phase structure conditions do. It tells us this is closed. And if we do this for matroid fans, we basically reconstruct the pseudo hyperplanar instrument. So um, it's kind of a tropical uh, folkman lorentz construction. I mean, the last thing I want to say is that um, these real phase structures and the link to toric geometry can also give us an obstruction to orientability. So I think this is really kind of cool. And I don't know how strong this obstruction is. It goes in one way, it, as far as I could prove so far. Um, so we can look at uh, our, our matroid fan for no matter what matroid we take, it's always a subfan of the fan we would get if we took the whole Boolean lattice. And this is the fan of the so-called permutahedral toric variety. And since this is always, a matroid fan is always contained in this, we get an inclusion of toric varieties and we get inclusion of the real toric varieties. So then we get a map between their homologies, an induced map, I star. And the theorem says that um, if this map from the D homology, where this, I should say, sorry, this is a D dimensional fan, that's what the D is, so rank D plus one matroid. If this map is uh, zero, so if the image of this homology vanishes, then M is not orientable. And uh, I would like to know if this is an if and only if. Uh, it's very hard to do computations because things go exponentially here since we're dealing with powers of two all the time. So I'll stop there and uh, thanks very much. Great, thank you, Chris. Let's give Chris a round of applause. And we have a couple minutes for questions. Any questions? Looks like Ben has a- Yeah, Ben. <laughs> I got kind of confused. Uh, so is this when there's two at least ways you can talk about orientability, right? You, and I mean, just say the word orientable in math times. Um, you can have an oriented graph in which you put an orientation of the edges, and that is a sort of a simple thing. And you can also have an oriented manifold, which is a sort of a more subtle thing. And I think you talked about both, and I'm confused now. Uh, so, yeah. I only talked about, I talked about a different, I talked about orienting graphs, which is, you know, always possible if you don't have any conditions on what you want for your orientation. And then I talked about um, um, orienting matroids. And so yes. orienting a matroid is equivalent to, so it's not orienting any kind of manifold, but there is a topological kind of side to the story. So orienting a matroid is equivalent to finding a pseudo hyperplane arrangement, like who's you know, then you have an oriented matroid whose underlying matroid is your M. Okay, but your um, the topological <laughs> class you construct, I'm not supposed to think of that as fundamental class or something. It's, it's a different Well, so I like this. So, uh, so there's another another way of formulating exactly, it's an exact equivalent to this condition in, in terms of toric variety, but using uh, uh, some, ho some homology theories. And it looks a lot like, at least an analogy, it looks very much like the construction of the steeple Whitney class. So if you want to oh, okay. hear more about them, I can tell you that. Sure, but, yeah, uh, I'd love to hear something. It's, it's a <laughs> class that know. lands in a homology group of some space with really weird coefficients. So I it's, see. A, it's okay. kind of a tough oh. <laughs> There's more to the story before that than now. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we have uh, Liam has some time. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, Chris. Um, I was just curious if either using like the cryptomorphism result or uh, your theorem here at the end, are there like cases of 
matroids where somehow this is like the easiest way of doing this like i guess like how hard of how hard of, of is it to use this as a way of achieving a certificate of non-orientability so i think this is very very hard and i mean it, it okay it's not an if and only if but it should at least be um if it were to be an if and only if, it should be probably very difficult because uh, this is supposed to be an MP-complete problem. Uh, but you yeah. see also in this, so um, to get these real torque varieties, there there is this uh, take two to the n copies of, of Rn and make some identification of them. Or if you want two, two to the n copies of the moment polytope of a complete torque variety and glue up the faces. So if you're thinking about computing cellular homology of these things, Mm. And you have some cellular decomposition of every moment polytope, then you're so, and you take two to the n copies of it, your chain groups are getting exponential as the dimension goes up. So yeah. that's a sign of what's what's going on and how this is, you know, not going to be an easy certificate. On the other hand, it's a it's it could be interpreted as a sign that you're right and it could be an if and only if, <laughs> which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um Maybe one other quick question that probably has a short answer. I guess. Um, so you know, you you put this real uh, this real phase structure on the the fan, but there's also the associated polytope. I was just curious if there's some nice discrete geometry interpretation of a real phase structure on the associated polytope side. Like, yeah. So the matroid polytope, you mean the base polytope, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, so um, so there are like a versions of or like definitions of uh, orienting your matroid in terms of bases mm -hmm. so you think a, a base is something that's determinant non-zero right but when you're over r you could ask okay if you order your basis say you fix an ordering in the ground set you ask is the determinant then um plus or minus with that with that ordering and so in a way you can't yeah you can put those plus minus signs on the vertices of the base polytope and then you're looking a lot like something that Vero's patchworking would do Right. So I think the the place to look at this is a paper of Georg Loho, Marcel Slea, and Chiho Yuan, where they do patchworking of linear spaces from from this point of view of putting signs on them. Cool. The the high complex. Thank you.